Okay. So when we think about trauma or how to define trauma, this is also something that has been evolving throughout the decades. We used to emphasize the event so much, for example, an assault or domestic violence or an earthquake, a car crash. And of course, the event is part of the equation. But the way that we understand trauma today is that trauma is not the event, but trauma is how our nervous system has responded to the event. It's a very, very important differentiation also because this prevents, you know, some from saying, well, this doesn't sound like a trauma or this doesn't count as trauma. Well, if the nervous system reacts like it is, this probably was traumatic for that person. And this is very important to think about in terms of, you know, trauma informed practices, um, as we said earlier, realizing that there's a prevalence of trauma and the prevalence is very, very high. Um, when we think about how trauma can manifest and can manifest in different ways, for example, uh, people can become what we call hyper reactive, hyper vigilant, which basically means that the person is constantly scanning for their environment for signs of danger and they are sort of prepared in case anything happens and everything sort of operates from this survival mode. So it's almost like I am ready to act, I am ready to mobilize. But sometimes it can also look like a little bit of the opposite way or a mix of the two, which is more like immobilizing and becoming sort of more flat, more checked out, uh, more like the person is sort of somewhere else. And that can look a little bit more like dissociation, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, these defenses come for different reasons physiologically, but they are coping mechanisms for the person to try and stay safe. Sometimes the hypervigilance comes when the person feels there's a choice. Can I fight? Can I flee? Sometimes when it seems like there isn't a choice, the person will start numbing out and dissociating to try and minimize the pain of a situation that is not escapable, which is one of the reasons why dissociation comes up so much in survivors of chronic trauma as opposed to acute trauma. And knowing all of this stuff also informs practitioners and you know, all other professionals when it comes to policies, practices, procedures, you know, knowing about the stats, but also how to be in space, you know, in the space mm -hmm. with trauma survivors. How do I use my body language? How do I use my voice? You know, how do I learn to read the cues? Because sometimes when someone is looking around a lot and seems like they're not really listening, it's not that they're not listening. It's that they, they have to tend to every single cue in the environment to make sure that they're safe. So the trauma lens approach really helps us understand, okay, this person is trying to survive. It also helps the person who's, you know, in the, in the room, if they have that lens, that they're not creating the wrong meaning of what they're seeing. So that mm -hmm. the interpretation of what they're doing is truer to what is being really experienced by that person, as opposed to assuming, well, they're just not listening. So, exactly. Yeah. So there's a benefit on both sides. Can you explain what the word dissociation means? Yes. So dissociation is... Again, we could say a coping mechanism, a psychophysiological reaction, a symptom. I mean, we could label it in many different ways, but it's the idea that it's a loss of integration in someone as a result of trauma in their sense of self, sometimes their awareness, sometimes their memory. It's almost as if you imagine a lot of things that tend to go together, you know, the way that we feel, the way that we think, the way that we remember, the way that we feel that we are ourselves becomes a little bit fragmented, disintegrated. So that can result in someone not being able to really tune into their bodily sensations, not really remembering important events that happen in their life, um, oftentimes related to trauma or not necessarily. Uh, sometimes it has to do with feeling that things around the person are not very real or the person has sometimes sensations that they're not real or they're disconnected from their body, out of their body. Um, 
it can also look like identity confusion or sometimes, you know, even things such as dissociative identity disorder, where there's a fragmentation in identity as a result of the trauma. Hmm. It can look like many things. It can be someone who's very spaced out, someone who can't recall what they did the day before, where they bought the clothing that they're wearing. And hmm. there's something, there's almost like a lizard like energy. When someone is dissociated, when someone is in, in fight or flight, it's more like, you know, a dog ready to pounce. You know, I'm ready, I'm ready, who's coming? I'm ready for you. Um, or a deer ready to run. Mm -hmm. But there's something more lizard-like about dissociation. It's like immobilization wow. and just, you know, trying to minimize what might come. Mm -hmm. Wow, and I think one of the things that we're really kind kind of coming to understand now, um, especially from some consensus papers in the speech pathology world, um, is that dissociation is associated with or can be a part of functional neurological disorders with communication symptoms, which primary muscle tension falls underneath. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like relevance to our agentic voice podcast, Dissociation is something that voice care workers might see in the students that we work with, in the patients that we work with, who might be dealing with um, uh, primary muscle tension, dysphonia, and it, it can be seen in the people that we work with who might be showing um, post-traumatic stress, signs mm -hmm. of stress. And then you said it can also occur on its own, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me because if we think about, you know, how much of this has to do with the autonomic nervous system and the fact that that connects to the larynx. And of course, there's so much that we still don't know about this body of science and all of these connections. Mm -hmm. But to me, it definitely makes a lot of sense, even intuitively, because if we think about dissociation as, again, a little more veering towards the other side, as opposed to like fight or flight, it's more going to this parasympathetic regulated place, this shutdown place. It's very, very different from this. So, so we could say almost like overly energized fight or flight reaction. So the idea that something becomes immobilized even vocally. I remember I was listening to a lecture by Ruth Lanius who was talking about this. I thought it was really interesting and it just sort of sparked my curiosity to learn more but she was talking about how when someone is a dissociative shutdown state, you know, sort of like the more the person goes in the direction, the less vocal they become. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, I think I'm used to thinking of um, fight or flight with PTSD. Mm. As someone who might be very emotionally reactive if they're triggered, you know, um, and so like one of the things that I'm often thinking about is not matching energy for energy because you don't know what a person might be going through or dealing with or reliving. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I necessarily know uh, what associative reactions look like in people because it seems like the goal of this kind of a coping mechanism is to hide or not be seen, mm -hmm. to kind of check out. So. What does this look like? And is it something that can be um, uh, triggered or habitual like a fight or flight reaction?